Evening, everybody. Welcome. Uh, as most of you know, I'm Craig Snyder, the president of the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia. And I appreciate your being here with us uh, tonight uh, for this, uh, I would say, even more than usually difficult and even more than usually important discussion. Uh, as you've all seen uh, on our PowerPoint and elsewhere, the council has a diverse and a really packed schedule uh, for this fall, which uh, we hope you'll join us for other programs that interest you as well. Uh, next week, we kick, we kick off our election 2016 series, which is part of our Great Debates initiative, and we'll be featuring author Talmadge Boston, uh, who has a new book out about uh, the qualities of presidential leadership. Um, I can think of some people who should read that. Um, uh, also, uh, next week, uh, we present, also next week, to, to next week, uh, we present one of our nation's uh, most senior business executives, uh, Michael Ducker, who is the president and CEO of FedEx Freight and also the vice chair of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Mr. Ducker will be offering his perspective on international trade, uh, which, as you know, uh, has been at the forefront of the presidential campaign, both in the primaries uh, and uh, here in the, in the home stretch of the general election. Uh, I want to thank our partners for those two events, uh, the Union League and the Fox School of Business at Temple University uh, for their uh, efforts on those upcoming programs. So turning back to this evening uh, and our guest, uh, Sue Klebold. Uh, Sue will make opening remarks uh, followed by a conversation uh, that she and I will have and then we'll have some time for questions uh, from all of you. Uh, you all know that Sue is the mother of Dylan Klebo, uh, one of the students uh, responsible for, and also one of those lost in the Columbine High School tragedy in 1999. Her story, her family's story, her community's story, have been principal sparks uh, for a series of national and even global conversations about a number of really significant issues, from mental health to the availability of firearms, to the responsibility of parents and others close to individuals who commit heinous acts. Sadly, there is an increasing scale and pace of incidents of mass violence uh, committed by individuals or small groups, some of them with avowed political intentions, and others without any such expressed motivations. Uh, but the questions uh, raised by Sue's story, I think, become uh, more frequent and more urgent to all of us uh, with almost every passing uh, day of news. Uh, just last evening, we all could watch, we all had the opportunity to watch uh, a tortured, and from my point of view, frankly, torturous interview uh, with the father of the alleged bomber from this weekend's uh, incident, uh, incidents uh, in New York and New Jersey. Uh, as I watched, I couldn't help but think uh, of the relevance to our uh, discussions uh, this evening. And again, I think that relevance uh, is something that you can see uh, almost every day. We know we won't answer uh, all of the questions uh, that are going to be raised here in a definitive way, and certainly not to the satisfaction of the many different and legitimate perspectives on these issues that are relevant to this matter. But as always, our uh, aim at the World Affairs Council is to replace heat with light and to stimulate further uh, conversation. So with that, please join me in welcoming the Sioux people. Um, April 20th, 1999 was over 17 years ago. That was the date of the Columbine High School shootings. It will be 18 years this coming April, and I sometimes can't believe it's been that long. It's hard to imagine that. What I want to talk about first is, is give you a picture of, of the magnitude of a tragedy like this. We very often think of the people who were killed, people who were injured, but um, a trauma such as this is so layered and it permeates so many aspects of our society. My son and his friend Dylan killed 12 students and a teacher before taking their own lives. They injured more than 20 others, and I say injured more than 20 because I honestly don't know how many were injured. It depends on who was counting and how they counted. What is an injury? Does it mean going to the emergency room for a panic attack? 
Does it mean having shrapnel in some part of your body? So that the accounts that I heard for this event were actually different. And to this day, I cannot tell you how many people were actually injured. In addition to, to that, to the people who were immediately affected, of course, their loved ones were affected. They were traumatized. They were grief-stricken. Um, they, they were impacted in ways that uh, many of us can't even imagine. Uh, one of the young women who was shot and sustained a spinal cord injury, her mother took her own life within a few months after the tragedy because she herself was someone who had experienced depression and she killed herself at a pawn shop after purchasing a gun. So um, these things, there are just a ripple in the water. There is not only um, psychological damage, but think about the physical suffering, the people who, who were injured, who sustained um, spinal cord injuries, uh, facial disfigurement. They will deal with these for the rest of their lives. It's not something they can ever put in the past. They are going to have expensive, uh, very often painful medical health issues because of this event. There was damage to a school, to a building. I mean, this was one of the many things that I tried to comprehend when this was over. The high school was a multi-million dollar school, and because this event had taken place, there were people in the community who wanted to just tear it down. But it was a new building. So they had to sort of negotiate what they were going to do with this building and how they were going to make it so that people would feel safe and be able to go into this environment again. And what they ultimately decided was to do some extensive remodeling so that it had a different feel and look in the library where so many of the people that died was in a different location and looked different. Think of the people in all the associations of uh, churches, synagogues, community partners, um, friends of people that were in the school. When I returned to work, one of the first things I learned was that one of my colleagues at work what, her husband was a teacher in Columbine, and he uh, stood and um, was with his friend, Mr. Sanders, when he bled to death. So I could not get away everywhere I went of seeing the magnitude of this. In addition, a community such as Littleton went crazy with lawsuits. Everybody was blaming everyone else. Everyone was suing everyone else. Our family was sued by 36 families. Um, in addition, the police department was sued for not rescuing some of the uh, individuals in time. And in fact, the teacher who did die, um, his family sued the fire department, the uh, police department, and they won the lawsuit because they didn't intervene fast enough. Because they didn't know what was happening in the school and they didn't know if it was safe or not. The young men who sold the boys the guns, they didn't know they'd done anything wrong. They believed that Dylan and Eric were 18 years old because they had met them at a gun shop where they had gotten in where they shouldn't have been. So the young man who sold the gun to them ended up getting a six-year prison sentence. And then we have the issue of copycat, where Columbine is sort of this standard that people look at over and over again. And they refer to it as you know sort of a benchmark for other shootings. And I, I cannot tell you how many people have told me that their children are fascinated by this shooting. They keep, keep information on Dylan and Eric. I've had girls, young women, write me from all over the world telling me they wish they could have Dylan's baby, that they loved him, that they identified with him. So that's another way that this is permeating the culture and raising the danger of these kinds of incidents. But for me, what I lost that day was I lost my son. And I, he was beloved to me. He was a gifted kid. He had just been accepted at four colleges, uh, universities, and he, we had just made a college visiting trip to go see the University of Arizona. That was his first choice school. He had gone to a prom the weekend before the shootings. The shootings were on Tuesday morning. He had come, gone with six couples, 12 kids, came back early in the morning, told me that he had the best time in his life, thanked me for buying the tickets. And three days later, 
he was uh, blowing up a school, trying to, and shooting people. So I was in a great state of denial. I couldn't believe that he had done this. I couldn't believe that he was there willingly. The night of the prom, he was talking with his friends about their future and what they wanted to do and who was going to come back in a muscle car first. He was talking about his future. So those of us who were close to him were not aware of his level of any suicidality whatsoever. It was not on our radar screen. And I not only lost my son, and will never see him again, or touch his face, or hold his hand, but I lost his identity because overnight he became a monster. I mean, he, he was this beloved child to me. And uh, overnight, he became something and someone who was terrifying. I had nightmares about that. I remember having a dream that he was a little baby in my arms, and I was showing him to somebody and I looked down at this little baby, and his face turned monstrous, and he had these sharp metal teeth, and he turned into a frightening entity. And in this dream, I, I kissed him, I kissed his face to hide it so that no one would see the monster, because I wanted to protect him from looking like a monster to someone else. And the other great difficult thing I lost that day was I lost my own identity as well. I had always thought that I was a good mother. I had thought that um, I had raised children who were responsible, uh, caring, healthy. And on that day, anything I believed about myself and my role as a human being got destroyed as well. So when I speak, I have several challenges as um, the parent of someone who uh, committed such atrocities and hurt other people. One of the things I have to deal with locally is that when I walk into a room such as this, I never know if there's someone in the room who has suffered greatly because of something that my child did. And this was something that gave me a tremendous amount of fear and anxiety because I was always afraid of encountering somebody who would be a family member or someone who was hurt or killed. Um, it gave me so much anxiety that eventually I started having anxiety issues that required medical attention. Um, so that's one of the issues that I have. And so when I come before, I really feel it's my responsibility to apologize for what a member of my family has done. So with all of my heart. I'm sorry if anything my son has done to cause anyone in this room any pain. One of the other difficult challenges I have is that I have since learned from all the reading I've done, the study, and the years and years of therapy, that I believe that my son's death was a suicide, that he was motivated to be there that day not because of his wish to kill, but because of his wish to die. And that his own suicidality created this vulnerability that he had. And uh, in many circles, even referring to his death as a suicide is an affront because people see him as a murderer. But I have studied his suicidality to try to understand how someone could end up killing. Um, Dylan uh, died in a murder-suicide, and it, it is a somewhat rare event. About 1 to 2 percent of all suicides um, involve the murder of another person and of murder-suicides. The rarest type is this sort of mass shooting that Dylan did. More commonly, we have uh, spousal or uh, relationship murder-suicides, and very often those can be altruistic. For example, you might be an older husband who's been caring for a wife for a long time and you believe that that person, that you're doing something merciful to end their lives and then end, and then end your own. But what Dylan and Eric did was statistically very rare. It was a double suicide. It was a double murder suicide. Um, the other, one of my other concerns is that I have come to believe in the years of research that I've done that my son was not in his right mind. Something was wrong with his brain function. And this brings up one of the most difficult challenges we have, which is how we don't want to increase the stigma or the fear 
to imply that someone who has a mental health issue is dangerous. Yet, I, I do believe that Dylan had some kind of undiagnosed mental health issues. And I believe that someone who is in an extremely suicidal state has lost access to their tools of self-governance. They are in a lot of psychological pain. And they are responding to that pain. And they don't make decisions the same way we do. It's not a choice to necessarily choose where to go for dinner, what car to buy. Suicide is not a choice that people have. They are responding to um, a stage four medical health crisis at the time of their death. So, and I, I'm going to sort of wrap this up because I know we got to have other uh, questions coming. But the one thing I did want to comment on is that as, as the mother of someone who did die by suicide, I've become really involved with other suicide loss survivors. Um, I've been active with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, the National uh, Lifeline, Suicide Prevention Lifeline, and some other organizations. And recently I was at an, an event where everyone in the room had lost a loved one to suicide. And, and we took a poll and we said, you know, how many of us had no idea that our loved one was suicidal? Half the people in the room, I was one of them, raised our hands. Because we did not have any idea of the usual signs of suicide, talking about being a burden, giving things away. These things didn't happen. The other people in the room, the other half, had loved ones who died by suicide after they had received treatment, in some cases years of treatment. So to me, this very clearly points the way to what we, the two aspects of this problem. One, we need greater education for all of us to determine when someone we love is suffering, how to ask the right questions, how to listen, how to respond and help without judgment. That's the group I fall into and have a great deal of guilt and judgment for myself. And then the other piece of this puzzle is, how do we ensure that people we love get better care when they need it? That people have better training, they, they can have access to health care that isn't impeded by our silo systems, by insurance, and other factors. So I think I'll just stop talking now. So in the conversation that we had preparing for this evening, um, one of the things you said was, if we were going to make reference to any other sort of mass violence event, um, that I should assume that you might well not know about it uh, because you've found it necessary to shield yourself uh, from the, the uh, memories that that brings. So, and I wonder if you could just, to sort of start us off here, if you could just talk through that process with our audience. How do you decide when to turn on the news and when not to turn on the news, and when people <coughs> undoubtedly want to ask you about the latest, um, how do you deal with it? Um, I, I have talked with quite a few survivors of different kinds of traumatic loss. And for those of us who have been involved with these you know, high profile, newsworthy events, it is not unusual that we all find it difficult to watch the news. Um, what I have done is, in the beginning, when I was going through this and I was still very new at this and I had a lot of fear, anxiety, grief, I, I actually did experience turning on the radio and hearing myself being talked about. And, you know, I was called disgusting and, um, I, you know, you're evil and all these things. And it was too difficult. I just couldn't turn on any radio. I couldn't turn on the television. As the years have gone by, I do listen a little bit when there's a shooting. One of the first questions I do ask myself is I want to know if it was a suicide involved because not all mass shootings are motivated by suicidality. Some are and some aren't. So that's usually one of the first questions I ask. And um, I very often hear parents who, like me, are in denial. You know, my son got in with the wrong crowd. He couldn't have done this. And I feel compassion very often, uh, not just for the people who had family members who were killed and injured, but I know that the parents of the perpetrator have a long road ahead of them. 
that they have to go through denial, they have to go through learning to accept, and um, I'm, I'm aware of that process and, and I know how hard it is. One of the things that, that, that clearly comes to mind and that you mentioned yourself is this societal judgment of, of you and people similarly situated. You felt the need to apologize, but I wonder if, if, if intellectually, you think there is uh, that is that there's uh, any justification for uh, people's judgment that parents or others close to a person have some measure of responsibility. They should have seen something. They should have done something. Is there is there any fairness to that in your view? You know, I was that person before this happened to me. I would look at events and see kids, uh, and I would think, where were the parents? You know, this, this kid obviously wasn't raised well, or this wouldn't have happened. I was one of those people. Um, not that it's right, <laughs> but that, that's the way I felt. I mean, I think when our kids are in third grade and they bring home a D in a, in a subject, that's not their D, that's mama's D. You know, it's the way it feels, is that I should have made sure that this didn't happen. Um, I do want to say a little bit about responsibility and guilt and, and what I have felt and what most survivors of suicide loss feel is that no matter how much therapy I have or how much I work through this again and again, as a mother of someone who uh, took his own life, I always wish I had said those magic words. I always wish I had listened without saying anything, that I had given him an opportunity to speak. So there's a piece of me that always feels responsible for not saving his life. But I never felt responsible for kids blowing up the school and shooting people because we didn't have a violent home, we didn't have guns in our home, I didn't want to watch violent movies until he reached the age of 17 and could get into them without my permission. Um, so I, I felt that there was nothing in his moral upbringing that I felt caused his violence, but I certainly felt responsible for his misery and his wanting to die. Um, so let's talk about the, some of the policy implications that, that, you, that you alluded to. Uh, so ever since that point, whenever there is uh, uh, an, an act of mass violence, particularly the mass shooting, there's instantaneously two camps that emerge. Uh, one focused on the access to firearms, and seeking additional uh, regulation of firearms. One focused on mental health as the sort of you know, uh, dispositive factor in causing the event. Um, the politics have been, I think, that those two forces have really sort of stalemated each other. As a practical matter, not a lot has changed in policy uh, since Common Line, even though it's going on 20 years ago. Um, so, first I want to sort of separate them and talk about them one at a time to, to get your thoughts. Uh, do you have a view about gun regulation and the debates that go on around that, uh, informed by your experience? Have you been asked to be, to participate in the cause of uh, gun regulation, uh, legislative efforts? Uh, and what's your position on that? Um, a couple of thoughts come to mind. One is, when someone is distressed enough to do something as horrible as a, as a shooting, they are very ill. They are at, at the end of their ability to cope. And if we look at suicidality and, and certain types of violence in the same way that we look at medicine, a medical model, what, what makes some people have heart trouble or have obesity or have kidney disease? It's a combination of many things. It's genetic factors, it's biological factors. It's their personality and how they respond to the world and how the world feels to them. It's their environment. And the environment isn't just the home, it's the school culture, it's the national culture. It's triggering events. It's maybe they got arrested or had a girlfriend break up with them, or maybe they were humiliated. So I look at this issue as it is a complex a public health issue. That's the way I see it. Um, the other piece of this around guns is that 
I believe that we all, as human beings, have the potential to have times in our lives when we are very vulnerable, when we are ill. And in during those times, we are not going to respond in a responsible way. So when I think about gun safety, the real threat regarding guns and gun ownership is, is not so much that you will use them to hurt other people. The, the, the much greater threat is that you will use it to hurt yourself. And I know in the state of Colorado, 80% of our deaths by firearms are suicides. So um, I don't see this as an either or. I think this is something we have to look at together and we have to recognize that, that removing access to guns when one is in a crisis is extremely important. How we do that, I wish I had a good answer, but I just, that's my take on it. Which is, a, which is a much more nuanced. Yes. <laughs> than, uh, than we frequently hear in, in the political way. So turning to the other half, the, the, the mental health system. Mm -hmm. if, there, if, if there are lots of cases, like your son, where there are no visible warning signs, mm -hmm. uh, what policy changes in access to mental health, availability of mental health, uh, would do any good? Uh, so that's the first part. The second part is, you talked about the uh, Suicide uh, survivors group uh, uh, that you uh, that you mentioned, and you said half the folks had family members who were in treatment. Uh, so does that tell us that even if we extended access to the system, had it more available, uh, that we still wouldn't solve the problem because simply the state of mental health care is inadequate to deal with a lot of these problems? <coughs> tell me the first question. Uh, <laughs> If you had the best mental health system in the world, how would it catch someone like your son who did not have overt signs? Okay, and part of what happens with so many of us who are suicide loss survivors is we don't know what a sign is. We don't know how to recognize the sign. Um, Dylan didn't have the, um, the more overt signs, but there were things that were happening that people got pieces of. One of the things that happened was he stole something. He got arrested 14 months before he died. It was completely out of character for him. It was a change in behavior. And around that time, he got in trouble at school. He scratched a locker and he hacked into the computer system with his friend. Now, I didn't realize that a change in behavior to that extent could be a sign that something was going wrong. In some school systems now, they have threat assessment teams. And if, if Dylan had been in one of those schools that exists today, they would say, oh, this is a discipline problem. Uh, there was an arrest, had running with the law. And, and at the very end of his life, he'd written a dark paper. He would have been flagged for a suicide assessment. He would have been flagged for mental health care in a school that had that kind of a program. Not every school does more schools need to, but I am hopeful that those are the kinds of changes we can make that would make a big difference. Um, I think a lot of this gets down to training. We should require suicide prevention intervention training, not just for teachers, but for the bus drivers and for the lunch ladies and for anybody who works in the school because those might be the ones that the kids talk to. Um, Second question, please. I forgot what you were talking about. Well, the second question was, if you if you could have sort of the best possible mental health system, yes. uh, would it still prevent these events, given that you know so many folks who their loved ones were in treatment and yes. nonetheless, you know? I absolutely believe that when we have um, therapists and physicians who are trained to intervene and they use evidence-based practices, we know that those treatments work. We have statistics to show that people do not go on to die by suicide when they have had certain types of therapies, certain kinds of interventions. But the problem is the training is lacking. The data is, is not distributed widely enough. And not enough people know how to respond. Uh, for example, uh, maybe you've heard, anybody heard of um, there's a, uh, a suicide contract or a suicide prevention contract. It was quite the standard 15, 20 years ago. And that was something a therapist would use that would say to this person, promise me you're not going to die by suicide before I see you next week. And they would have the person sign it. 
Well, they've shown that those are completely ineffective. They don't work at all. But if you have a suicide, um, a, a suicide intervention plan, a safety plan, these are very effective. And what that, that does is the person himself or herself has to walk through and explain, I feel this way, and when I feel this way, that means this, and this is what I can do, and this is the person I can call, and this is something I can take or listen to, or, or someone I can be with. And that's a much more effective strategy. Many of our answers are already here, but so few people know them. Um, so, with your indulgence, I want to come back to, to your experience. You've described some life in the aftermath of a terrible trauma. Uh, I think that uh, trauma is, is ubiquitous. It touches everybody's life in different ways, different degrees, different terms. But uh, as, a, as a trauma survivor yourself, what advice do you give our audience and other audiences about coping with PTSD or related conditions uh, so that uh, people can be healthy and productive even in the face of these trauma? I heard a, a, a grief therapist speaking at a conference last week, and I loved what he said, and I wanted to share that. And this person said, my job is not to help you feel better, it's to help you feel. And I think one of the most important things we can do is help people feel what they are trying so hard not to feel. And um, as a, my therapist, I know, worked with me because my feelings were so conflicted, and I had fear and anxiety and lawsuits and newspapers and sorrow and grief. But the real work that we did was, for me, the necessary work was focusing on the grief, the grief aspect of loss. And um, so I think that's one of the most important things. I, I, I don't believe we can heal as well if we try to avoid the bad feelings. I think we have to accept them, lean into them, suffer with them. And, um, and develop our own, whatever works for us. I mean, I have certainly things that I do that make me feel healthy. I do Zumba and yoga and I draw and paint and I have friends and I um, you know, hang out with other suicide survivors. These are all things that, that have helped me, but I think we each have our own strengths and those are the things that will help you heal ultimately. Um, so we talked a little bit about the, the, the sort of the political response uh, to these kinds of things. Um, you've also dealt over almost two decades with the, uh, the media response. Um, and you, you mentioned earlier to me that uh, you were speaking to a group of journalists uh, training uh, to be able to cover these kinds of stories. So I wonder if you could talk about both, both parts of that. So the first, the first part is uh, your experience with, with the media. And don't hold back. Uh, uh, what do you think should be different? Should be Proof. Uh, and then the second is when you speak to journalists about that, what what do you ask them to do differently? Just so that everybody knows, there are guidelines for how to report on suicidal incidents. Um, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, in uh, in collaboration with other organizations, actually have a little handout on how to report on suicidal incidents. And it's critically important that we follow these things because very often we get contagion, especially with youth. So, um, and there's another tool that I'm going to plug right here, and that is another tool from the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. It's called After a Suicide, a Toolkit for Schools, and it's a free PDF you can download it. Because how the school or how a community handles the suicide may endanger other people if it's not done with great thoughtfulness. So um, there are guidelines to follow. Um, but there are no guidelines right now on how to respond to uh, a mass shooting or a tragedy. And I really believe that that's something we need to develop. One of the things we tend to do is we, uh, we look to answer the question, why? We always start out with, it's like a murder investigation. What's the first thing? You want to find a motive. Well, with suicide, that question is not the question we should be asking them. So red herring. If we say someone died because his girlfriend broke up with them, the 
because he got fired. What we are doing is normalizing suicidal behavior in response to disappointment that makes the risk go up. So we have to be very careful how we report that and, um, and try to emphasize that people who get treatment, that get over their period of suicidality. Um, so those are the things that I think should happen. My own personal experience with the media was was extremely awful, and it was I was I I actually lived in a house that was on ten acres, and we had a gate, so they didn't get to me, but they got to everybody that I knew. They got to family members, and I I just go on and on with stories. Um, there was one individual in the media who was ruthless. Um, you know he. He got into my all my emails at work because I was a state employee and they used the Open Records Act and wanted everything. They wanted to just sort of expose us to be able to say this is why this happened. He visited my, our, my hometown and got our, our high school yearbooks and uh, visited my uh, husband's um, family members in another state. And when they refused to talk to him, they went up and down the street saying, did you know that you live next door to the cousin of the Columbine killer? And it added a lot of stress. This is a, a media person who followed Mr. Harris, Eric's father, into a urinal so he could corner him when he could not get away and try to get a story from him. So, I mean, they got, the stories go on and on. And I told, I told the journalists at the, the Carter Center when I was there last week, I said, for those of us who are in the middle of these things, we see you as parasites. We see you as profiting by, my, by our losses, by uh, sensationalizing, uh, by not having, uh, by saying pretty things that are untrue, and, uh, and then making, inflaming people to, to uh, be angry and hateful and destructive and chop down trees that are planted in memory of my family, my, my son. So yeah, it's one of those things when I say don't get me started on the media, but, but I'm glad that I've had the opportunity now to talk with members of the media and say, you know, this, this is what it's like for someone who goes through this, and um, let's try to make this into a learning experience, and let's talk to, let's get quotes from experts on suicide and what happens in a suicidal mind, and how we can help people feel connected to each other and to resources. Thank you. Open it up to uh, questions uh, from the audience. We have a microphone so everybody can be heard. If you come on up, I'm sure there are questions. Come on. I'll make you a friend, please. You had mentioned that he was arrested um, 14 years. 14 months. Oh, 14 months. Looking back, were there any other signs about his behavior? Behavior, his comportment um, that were different. That just looking back um, might have contributed. And the other thing was he uh, at all in his growing up impulsive? Um, two questions. Okay, let's do the impulsive one first. I was not aware of him ever being impulsive. He was a very <coughs> deliberate kid. He liked to plan. He was the only person in the family who could save money because he was structured and put him on way. So I don't think he was impulsive. Um, the other question, um, as far as signs go, what I saw in him was that from the time he was in about seventh grade, I could see that he was really self-conscious, uncomfortable, um, easily embarrassed, you know, if you drop him off at school and then you yell out the window, Dill, and you get in the car and like, don't say my name in front of people, you know. But it was, it seemed normal to me. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't anything that I could say, this is a sign. The behaviors that were existing that indicated that he was suicidal was one, he purchased firearms, but I didn't know it. And only, and two of his friends knew it, but they were sworn to secrecy. So that could be something that would have been a blatant sign that something was terribly wrong, but I was not aware of it. Um, I think he was, you know, hiding drinking. He got alcohol somewhere, and drinking is another risk factor. Um, substance abuse is another risk factor for suicide. Um, being arrested is a risk factor for suicide. So we had those pieces, 
but I, I didn't put it together. And um, he, didn't, he wasn't a violent or angry person. He was a gentle person. And that's why it was not something that was on my radar screen. I wasn't even looking for that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You seem very, um, oh, very well put together. <laughs> and, uh, I'm sure it took many, many, many years, but you really, you really do. And I commend you for coming out and talking. And because I have three sons, and I have. Do you have other children, by the way? I do. I have. I had two boys, and uh, my other son is th three years older than Dylan. And he lives, he, and when the book came out, I had to promise my son and my husband that I wouldn't say anything about them ever, but he's <laughs> fine. And he's, you know, he's, oh, he's a nice, life. he's 38 years old and has a nice suburban life. And um, thank you. <laughs> uh, I thank you very much again. And uh, um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk outside a little bit so you know my, my uh, background right now. I'm just curious about uh, a few things. One, um, uh, you mentioned uh, threat assessments now in schools. That's kind of new that, that I've not heard of, and I think it's great. Are there any other major changes that the school system actually went through because of this? And, and two, um, you asked about the hospital and the medical community response. Well, what did they do? Have, have they changed things? Have they helped? Have they done anything um, in the community? And, and then I guess if you have time for a third, uh, how is community now responding to you? You may have to help me. Uh, yeah, sure. Which one do you want first? Um, I'll take the schools first. Okay. Um, uh, uh, changes in school. Uh, uh, the assessment is a great idea. Well, at Columbine, the, tra the tragedy changed school policies coast to coast um, almost immediately. Um, I, I have many friends who are teachers. I was a teacher in a, a community college system myself. But they have, for example, I can just name some. Of course, we have federal anti-bullying programs. Uh, they are much more uh, careful about how kids are treated in schools. One of my friends has, they do every day, they have, a, they have pictures on the internet for the teachers, or for their uh, intranet, to show which kids that they think are being picked on, to watch them closely and make sure that they're safe. Um, we have, of course, security issues in school. We have, in some cases, better training for the school resource officers. As far as the police go, we have CIT training, uh, crisis intervention training, and that's another thing that if, if you have to involve a, a police officer for something, request a CIT trained officer because they are, they are, uh, they have been trained to try to de-escalate, to try to talk with people who are over the top. Um, those are just some of the examples that I can think of. Um, we need to do more. But for the schools that, that have programs, I, I know somebody that works with a youth program and they, they really believe, she feels very strong that they've been able to stop several potential shootings. They have found someone who had gotten to the point of amassing weapons, writing the suicide note, and because of some uh, referral process within the school, they were able to help kids and prevent some of these things. So it's anecdotal, but I believe it works. Hospitals and medical community, how do uh, they respond? The, the physicians and the, and the hospitals in the area, they, they, how do they respond? You know, I'm not aware of any response. Um, I, what, what I have seen locally is that in our state, um, the people who work in hospitals, counselors, physicians, don't want to be told what to learn. And, and, and they very, are very resentful of anything coming close to a mandate to say you should have suicide prevention training, you should have uh, another big area in Colorado is um, at post-release from hospitals, um, people who have been hospitalized for a psychiatric hospitalization, their suicide risk actually increases. And uh, they are trying to develop programs now where the hospital provides information to the family to try to keep this individual safe. I think. I think some of them are coming along, but I don't think, I don't see any leadership much coming from that arena. And one thing that, that um, we now do in hospitals is, is uh, um, actually having shooting drills. So if, uh, if a shooter is either gunshots or, yeah. or uh, uh, there's something in the city, then, then we now drill for that kind of scenario. Yes. And we do the patients and 
the staff and things like that. So I know that's, uh, that's one end of this, uh, from, our, from our, our point of view as, uh, as a physician, that's what, uh, that's what we're doing now. And schools have active shooter drills as well, um, so much so that they, they are, you know, they're, they're actually desensitizing some of the kids to these things. And, and one last comment. So I, I can't believe Texas passed a law that if you're in a state school, you're allowed to carry your firearms in the college, but that's just editorial. Yeah, there we are. <laughs> um, this is a little bit more complicated than just the suicide. Okay, yes, good. absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk to the, um, the influence of uh, video games, which I guess yes. involved with, and the fact that there were two of them yes. working together feeding off each other. Right. Um, yeah, and, and I haven't talked much about how the, how the suicide kind of morphed into homicide. And um, I think there is evidence to show that video games does develop <coughs> a conditioned response sometimes to violence and to responding quickly. So I think that is that was one of the many pieces of this puzzle that helped facilitate that. But on the other hand, there are probably billions of people in the world who do video games and they don't do something like this. So it's not a causal relationship. But I do, I personally feel that it does play a role in this. Um, and your other question is? Um, the, the influence of the fact that there were two of them, that he had his friend, you know, yes. they, they worked with each other. I believe that was, Probably the most important thing of all for me um, was that uh, Eric, I had no idea how really disturbed Eric was. And, and, and I've often said if there was one thing that would have prevented Columbine, it was that if someone had shown me or Eric's parents his website, neither of us saw it. It was, if, if any of you have seen it, it, it was a frightening, it was graphic, it was violent. Um, just a terrifying website, and um, and I think that the two boys, and I've talked to different experts, but I think the two of them really had some kind of a codependent bond going on. That I've heard it um, proposed that that they really needed each other to do what it was they felt they needed to do. That Eric needed to Dylan to go ahead and uh, carry out this massacre and that Dylan needed Eric to motivate him to go ahead and have the courage to die. And I do believe, and they were adolescents, they were males, I mean, there were all these things that put them at risk even more. But um, yeah, I think the fact that there were two of them played a significant part. Mm -hmm. I had my, my courage to come out to speak about this. It's so important and um, come a long way, I'm sure. And um, I work with adolescents and young children. And just make a comment, and I'm in the medical field, and it's hard, still hard to get access to care. Um, there are very few psychiatrists in adolescent and pediatrics. And um, in the waiting list for depression can be up to three months. Find a counselor sometimes. So I find that very discouraging. Um, in light of even this incident, so 17 years later, I'm still finding it very difficult to uh, find care. Um, just to make that comment, um, I work both in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, and I encounter both the same thing in both places, two states, um, unfortunately. So, um, I have a question though about um, were you aware of any incidents of bullying or anything like that going on with Dylan or Eric? I was aware that the school environment had bullying in it because Dylan had gotten in trouble his junior year for scratching the locker. And he had told us that there were these kids in the school and they were younger than he was, were really giving him a hard time and he was angry at them. 
But, um, and then Dylan did talk about the jocks at the school, the athletes saying that he hated them. Uh, I was aware that, you know, so, but again, Columbine hadn't happened yet. So it wasn't that none of these things said to me, death is going to be the result. It was just, okay, high school is tough. And yeah, you've got kids that beat each other up. And yes, I was aware of incidents. I wasn't aware that he was bullied to the extent that he really was. I had no idea. Because first of all, he was like 6'4 and um, nice. And I, 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 it didn't occur to me that someone like that could be bullied. Um, but I was aware of, you know, little things would happen. Like uh, he came in with his, he had an old car, but uh, the, the hood of it was dented, like somebody had jumped on. And um, I, I didn't think it was a targeted act of violence. I thought <coughs> these dumb kids, you know, going through the parking lot, and because I actually taught a summer program, and I saw a kid leaping from hood to hood to hood in the parking lot as I looked out the window. But I think I'm in charge of this person right now. <laughs> um, so I didn't put that, I never saw anything as targeted violence or bullying. It wasn't until after he died that I put it all, it all came together. I did have an incident where he came home in his junior year where so many things were tough for him that year. And he did come home one day and he had spots of ketchup all over his shirt. And I said, what happened to you? And he said, I have just had the worst day of my life and I don't even want to talk about it. And I said, okay. And I will never forgive myself for that because I, you know, I, I somehow should have dug deeper, but I wanted to spare him and honor the fact that he just said, just give me some time, I, you know, and I did. So there were signs, and I didn't, because of who Dylan was, nobody thought he was capable of what he did. Um, even even the, the school counselor who saw the paper that he'd written, it was very violent paper, he went to Dylan, and because we, we were concerned, you know, that we, the teachers sent the counselor to read this paper. And when he read the paper, he said, Dylan, you know, you're not supposed to write papers like this. And Dylan said, I know. And he said, well, don't do it again. And he said, okay, I won't. That was the extent of the counseling he got for that issue. So, you know, the, the, the issue here, and I'm digressing, but the issue here is not how dumb we can all be. It's how good people can be at hiding who they are and what they're feeling. And he, he, was, he was the master. And I think in particular males. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you again. Thank you. Good evening, Ms. Beagle. Um, thank you for being so open and sharing your experience with us. Um, my question for you is, how do you think, um, how do you feel about violence and murder being romanticized on mass media? and how this plays a role in like mass shootings and other violent acts that we see nowadays. I hate it, and yes, it does play a role. But there's no question that it plays a role. Um, when I think of the people who have been involved in other school shootings, and I actually met one of the mothers of a, a school shooter who, you know, he, he had collected you know, pictures of the kids and with their guns on and all this stuff. It is very dangerous. and. Um, the visual image is especially dangerous. So when they show uh, surveillance tapes and they repeatedly show, you know, the kids, the videos they make in, in a basement, these things are very dangerous and um, it concerns me a lot. Um, yeah. For example, um, recently this movie came out that you the very um, admired, you know, it was called Suicide Squad. And I'm, I'm like asking this question because you know they romanticize and make it look so good to be bad and to use guns and to murder people and saying that you know sometimes the best solution to solving your problems is to put bullying into somebody. So I want to know like I take my sisters to go see this movie and I, I went there and I see all these parents with their children and I'm like you might think this is all about Batman and DC and all comics and it's all good and fun until so in the future you see it on the news and they're influenced by this. I, I completely agree, and, and one of the frightening things that as a parent, I was fighting that. I, you know, I didn't want them to see violent movies. If they'd go to somebody's house, I'd say, what movie are you going to show? And, well, that's, you know, can you show this one instead? And I, I thought I was on that, and you know, I didn't have, let them have toy guns, I and mean, it was all these things. 
Uh, and it was such a, a harsh realization to, to see how little control I had over that and how little influence. And I truly believe these things are bit by bit desensitizing us to violence, uh, reducing our decision making to um, simplistic thinking, and I think they're very dangerous. Well, thank you for your time. I Okay, we have time for one. You'll be the last one. I'll be the last one. Can you hand me anymore? No. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I'm really grateful that I have met you. I have met you. And, um, <clears throat> but the media, now this is going way back, and this is two things that I remember. Um, one, and then maybe it's Eric's side, because it seems like your son was bullied. Maybe he got close to Eric because he found friendship with him. I don't know. but. The media talked about how there was a lot of guns and things, paraphernalia, in a garage or someplace in the home. And so what people were talking about, like, where were those parents? How did they not see this? And so you had a bad rap. And I see that you're a beautiful person. So that, and the other thing is the whole issue that when someone shot that girl and they asked her if she was a Christian, yes. she said yes, and he shot her. I don't know which one. Can you talk about this? Sure, I will. And let me let me talk about this gun thing. Apparently, at some point, Dylan did bring a gun into our house. We don't know where. We don't know when. We don't know how. Um, but apparently, there was one. And the thing that I wanted to emphasize, and I didn't even put this in the book because I didn't want it to teach things, teach bad things. But that Eric had hidden guns in his home, and. One of the places he hid a gun was in a basement window well under the leaves in the dirt. How many of us check there when we're checking our kids' rooms? Um, another place he hid a gun, a shotgun, was um, he had taken, and the police told me this, that he had found a fluorescent light bulb box and put the gun in this box, put it up on a high shelf in the closet underneath everything. So. It, the thing, the point I'm trying to make is, is it? The, don't make the assumption that the guns were lying around because that's, well, that's what the media was saying. Yes, it's not that. true. Yeah. I, ha I have a, a, a dear friend whose son struggled with um, addiction problems starting it when he was in third grade, and she used to constantly try to search his room. And she said, when I search, I always take a screwdriver because he would hide drugs. For example, a light switch in a wall. Mm -hmm. He'd unscrew it, take a string, take a thumbtack, hang it down inside the wall, or he would put it inside a speaker. So the issue is, if someone wants to hide something, they're going to find a way to do it. And even the police uh, had to go back to Eric's house and look again because they couldn't figure out where the gun was hidden. So, so I am I get very upset when people imply that you know we as parents were just sitting around with right. all these firearms. Right. Um, the other piece of that was this issue of the, uh, the uh, Christian marker quote. One of the girls who was shot, the boys allegedly asked her if she believed in God, and she said yes, and then they shot her, supposedly. But like everything after Columbine, there was controversy, there was disagreement. The story was, because people when they're in a crisis don't remember very well, they're, they're very unreliable witnesses. So it turns out that the girl who was shot, who supposedly <coughs> answered yes, was in reality not the real person who did it. It was another person who was shot and who lived. It was Bailey Schnarr and not uh, Cassie Bernal. So then there was conflict in the community about which one was the, the truer Christian, which one was really the martyr. Um, so that's what transpired. What I see, the bottom line here is that if someone is, a sta is in a state of mind where they are killing and they want to kill, the way you do that, the way we do it as human beings is we dehumanize. We reduce people down to the essence, the simplest thing about them we can find. And this is so dangerous in politics I'm not going to talk about. But um, it's very easy to, to hate, to reduce people down to one aspect of who they are and um, hate them for that. <coughs> and I think that's what the boys were doing at the end of their lives.
lives. You, they weren't able to kill acknowledging who the person was or what they were doing. They made everybody into a symbol for something so that they could kill them. And I think that's what happened. Thank you very much. Thank you all. We're Thank you.